Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out tonight. The purpose of tonight wasn't simply to observe what I sometimes refer to as the downside of the social revolution of the 1960s, which fundamentally altered what were once traditional social values around things such as sex, marriage, divorce, single motherhood, drugs, and so-called welfare rights. We know that those changes in social values over the past 40 years have had an unequal social impact and have caused the biggest social problems on the lowest rungs of society. People who, as Anthony was suggesting, are least able to deal with the consequences of social change and their own behaviour. What this has created is an underclass of citizens whose dependent and chaotic circumstances can be attributed, and this is Anthony's great insight as well, not to material deprivation, but to behavioural poverty. The breakdown of social norms around things such as work, family and the raising of children. It's this last issue, the welfare of underclass children, that I want to initially focus on tonight, but in order to bring what I think is the real topic into focus. And that issue is, it isn't just the fact that the social revolution has caused social problems, it's that the triumph of countercultural values, what are sometimes called progressive social values, has created political and cultural barriers that prevent elites, whether they be in government or the media or in academia, from even acknowledging the downside of the revolution. Worse is that the prevailing ethos of permissiveness and non-judgmentalism in relationship to personal behaviour prevents opinion leaders and policy makers and others in positions of authority from summoning the will to try and do anything about addressing the resulting social problems. Now I want to talk about how these cultural politics play out in relation to my work on child protection and adoption, but I'm also going to try and raise some broader issues in the interest of sparking discussion. So I'm going to use this work to reflect on and make a few remarks about the current divisions on the centre-right over the issue of social values. And maybe I'll ponder the implications for those who might not want to sign up to stock standard left progressive views of the world on social and economic issues, even in the name of a unity ticket on the right. And then I want to try to reframe these issues, maybe hopefully moving on to possible solutions, around broader questions about the character of Australian society and our fabled commitment to the fair go in life. What I hope this might do is maybe discover some language or some aspirations that might recast and move forward the debate about social values, social problems in the underclass, and maybe help us transcend the cultural politics that I think impedes national discussion of what are really important social issues. Now everything I have to say tonight is based on the research that I've done for the CIS on child protection. This is also to say that I'm not a morals crusader and I'm not religious either. So I don't treat debates about social values as a moral or religious issue, but as a policy issue. What I think I bring to bear in analysing these issues is what is my formal training in history, which taught me to understand the social and intellectual forces that shape political and cultural systems and institutions. I think this approach is evident in the book that Greg mentioned that I published last year um, on, child on child protection, The Madness of Australian Child Protection, Why Adoption Will Rescue Australia's Underclass Children. Now, the book has a very simple argument um, concerning the problems in the child protection system, but it also provides um, at length the cultural, it examines the cultural and political obstacles to changing the system with the major obstacle being that the preference among political and cultural elites to endorse pr progressive social values and reject what is perceived to be a traditionalist throwback social policy like adoption. Now the argument, about the, the argument the book makes about the systemic problems in the child protection system is relatively straightforward. It is that Australian child protection authorities fail to properly protect children because they believe in family preservation at almost all cost, which exposes children to prolonged abuse and neglect by dysfunctional underclass parents. 
When children are then finally removed as a last resort, the goal is always to try and reunite them with their uh, families. So they experience long periods of highly unstable foster care and then repeat breakdowns of family reunifications that break down because the, the family's fundamental um, dysfunction and problems, drug and alcohol abuse, domestic violence, reoccur. Now due to this cycle of instability and maltreatment, many damaged children end up spending almost their entire childhoods in care and never find a safe and permanent family for life. Many of these children could have and should have been removed earlier and permanently and been adopted, but adoption is almost totally non-existent in Australia. The departments just won't do it. Now, there are lots of stats and facts in the book that back up this argument, and the larger one I make, which is that these child protection failures are one of the chief means by which intergenerational disadvantage is perpetuated and the underclass replicates itself. And even though I would say this, um, I really think the case that I make out against the current approach and in favour of adoption is unanswerable. But having the facts, logic and evidence on your side is only half the battle in terms of changing policy. There's a reluctance to support adoption among the political class because of its bad reputation. And that's partly due to flawed past practices and the harm that was done to some adopted people and around the issue of identity in the era when adoptions were closed, when people, when adopted people couldn't have contact with birth parents, they were treated as blank slates without any heritage, caused harm to some adopted people. There's no question about that. These aren't fatal objections, however, because we've learned the lessons and adoptions these days are open, it means children have contact with um, birth parents and extended families, and we also pay far more attention to nurturing their identities and their, and their heritages as part of good practice. We also, of course, need to judge the potential benefits of adoption against the real harm that the lack of adoptions is currently doing. But the other problem about, with adoption, about its reputation, is that it's inextricably intertwined with the era of forced adoptions. The days when unwed single mothers were forced to give up their children for adoption to, to be adopted by married couples. Now, forced adoption was the means by which Traditional social values around sex, marriage and children were enforced in ways that we would obviously consider harsh and punitive today. Hence, as the social revolution took effect, the practice of forced adoption was scrapped and was replaced by what we like to think of as the more enlightened approach of supporting single mothers through the welfare system. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. Social change, social progressivism has led to social problems. The end of forced adoption has created the very social problems that forced adoption was designed to prevent. The creation of a dependent underclass of single mother families in which child welfare and protection concerns are concentrated. But herein lies the chief obstacle to getting more adoptions. If we're to increase adoptions today, this will inevitably mean telling single mothers they can't keep their children. The circumstances are obviously very different. We're talking about adoption due to demonstrable dysfunction and proven abuse and neglect, not due to marital status. But the echo of forced adoptions and of the so-called conservative values of the 1950s is enough to make policymakers shy away from adoption. The credit, or perhaps the blame for this, can go to the anti-adoption movement, which plays the cultural politics of this issue very cleverly. Any adoption movement is very interesting. It's usually led by academics, usually social work academics, who have an ideological hatred of adoption. This is because it goes against their notion of social justice, which is the belief that material poverty causes child abuse and that adoption therefore punishes poor parents. The rank and file of the movement, though, is made up of mothers, children and some fathers who were subject to forced adoption. Now they argue, based on their lived experience, that adoption is an inherently harmful practice and they demand that there be no adoptions at all. And this demand seems to be partly about self-validation and ensuring that their own experience is publicly affirmed by keeping adoption taboo. But the way that the, that the taboo is enforced is by linking any suggestion of the greater use of adoption to a return to the bad old judgmental days of forced adoption. The effect of this is to make adoption cultural poison for many elites who don't want to be seen to be judging 
different families. Now I document this in the book by looking at the state and national parliamentary apologies for forced adoption and by noting how politicians across the political spectrum use the occasion to endorse the sentiments of the anti-adoption movement. Now, this meant basically endorsing family preservation over adoption. And the reason I did this is because the political and cultural risk of supporting adoption is that you'll be tarred with a traditionalist social conservative brush and be likened to the baby snatchers of the 1950s. Now, it's not surprising that politicians are reluctant to out themselves as social conservatives or fear even being perceived as socially conservative. Most people are social animals, we crave peer and group approval, and therefore we tend to, we tend to prefer to endorse social values that are culturally ascendant because that's what the culture rewards you for doing. The reality is that in contemporary society there's a cultural price to pay in condemnation and marginalisation, often doled out by the ABC or Fairfax or Twitter, for even appearing socially conservative on social issues such as marriage, which is the, the obvious example. This is because, thanks to the long march of the left through the institutions, that the commanding heights of these, of, of these key cultural institutions, including the universities, are bastions of countercultural and anti traditional values. What was particularly revealing and quite disheartening about the forced adoption apologies was the extent to which politicians on the right also endorsed the idea of family diversity. This is the idea that all families are equal and equally good for children, regardless of parents' marital status. The apologies basically <coughs> became an, op an opportunity to virtue signal and for individuals to self-congratulate themselves on how progressive they were by saying, in effect, see, I'm not like those horrible conservatives of previous generations who judged and stigmatised single mothers. Now, it's fine if people have those convictions and people can have any convictions they like, but the problem is that this is not enough if it prevents taking responsibility for the social consequences of the social revolution. And this is exactly what has happened around the adoption of underclass children. Those in positions of authority would rather not jeopardise their social status and their self-perception as right-thinking social progressives and thus don't face up to the social realities and do something about a terrible social problem. So this brings me to the little local difficulties that are occurring on the centre-right. Social wets might say banging on about social conservatives issues is a distraction from the main game of prosecuting an economically dry agenda and that prosecuting the culture war for traditional values against progressive values is a waste of time and effort that loses friends and influences nobody. I might well have a distorted perception because of the work that I've done on child protection, but I also understand the chaos and harm that progressive values, so-called progressive values, have wrought in society and continue to do through the child protection system. I also question whether being socially wet and economically dry is even internally consistent, and whether this is actually self-defeating. The child protection system alone costs us over $4 billion nationally each year, and the cost has doubled since the year 2000. And this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the costs of the social revolution and its contribution to growth in government spending, not only in child welfare, but in areas like health, education, homelessness, domestic violence, justice. <coughs> There's figures in the UK which suggest that the, that the 500,000 most dysfunctional families in Britain cost the British taxpayer over £30 billion annually. There's no reason to think that the costs aren't similar here. It suggests that if you want to cut the size of government, shrinking the size of the underclass might be a, might be a place to start. On top of that, think about all the government programs on top of the direct costs of the welfare system that are designed to address social disadvantage. I think also of the constant push to spend even more to break the cycle of disadvantage. Think as well about all the debates about inequality and how they rarely, if ever, trace social inequality and social disadvantage back to the major social phenomena of the 1960s, the breakdown of the family, and that's despite the wealth of social science evidence showing that family breakdown is a leading cause of social inequality. My point simply is that if we're serious about tackling disadvantage, let alone reducing the size of government, 
I can't see how we can avoid thinking and talking about so-called social, uh, so-called social conservative issues. Otherwise, we're just going to be chasing our tail. This is also why I'm convinced that the centre right needs to be, if not a broad church, then a double-sided movement. Yes, we need to stress the importance of individual freedom, but we also need to realise when liberty has become <coughs> licence, which is when private behaviour has public consequences, especially when taxpayers pick up the bill for the collapse of social norms, also known as personal irresponsibility. I can't help but ponder, perhaps, the deeper significance of the unwillingness to take up the issue of adoption. If centre-right politicians can't make out the case for adoption and are unwilling to assume the cultural and political risk this entails, which can be neutralised with a little bit of political nous, this begs a further question. Will they really have the political will and skills to tackle public education and public health reform, which are the issues central to issues like budget repair, reducing the size of government, cutting tax and boosting economic prosperity? Well, let me put it this way. If taking on safe schools and the Ros wards of the world are too tough a political challenge, then good luck taking on the AMA and the education unions. So maybe the real battle on the centre-right isn't between Delcons and versus the trendies, but between those with some principle and those with no principle who'd rather court the approval of the cultural left for the sake of a quiet and undistinguished life. I'll just leave that thought hanging out there. Hang on, sorry, still going. <laughs> finally, finally, he, he wants to cut me off before the positive bit comes. Sorry, I want to canvas just one potential way that I think we can counter the grip of the counterculture on debates about social and economic issues that I think should be central to a centre-right agenda. I want to suggest a different paradigm in which we can maybe talk and think about this, these issues. These thoughts have been prompted by my recent reading of Stan Grant's much fated book, in his book, Grant argues that Indigenous people have been denied the migrant dream in Australia, that's of freedom and opportunity, due to the persistent legacy of racism. Now, I don't think very much of Stan's book, um, and how little I think of it, hopefully you might get to read soon in Quadrant if the magazine publishes my extended thoughts on it. But my major problem with it is that his account of Indigenous disadvantage is completely wrong-headed. What has trapped Indigenous people in suffering and poverty isn't racism, but it's the political agenda of self-determination, as any serious analyst of Indigenous gaps has to acknowledge. It's not only that Grant himself is living proof that Indigenous people can live the Australian dream. As someone from a migrant background who has enjoyed every advantage that this country can give to all comers, what also irritates me about his book is that it fails to perceive, and in an area where I think this insight is crucial, exactly what the Australian achievement has been. Why has this country managed to give so many people from so many backgrounds so much freedom and opportunity, exceeding all but a, probably a few other places in the world? My answer, and it's still a work in progress, but compared to other nations with far less enviable records, we have not and do not in general make ordinary people a victim of political ideology. Now, the standout exceptions is Aborigines in remote homeland communities where the results of capital S and capital D self-determination policies I think speak for themselves. The other exception, I believe, is child protection policy and more generally in relation to a lot of the permanent underclass that continue to live the consequences of the social revolution in the form of intergenerational dysfunction. What do I mean by ideology? I think ideology becomes a problem in a pejorative sense when it means we deal with the world the way we want it to be rather than the way it is. So it becomes a problem when it stops us thinking clearly and critically about social problems. For example, if we want to keep believing that family diversity is an unadulterated positive social development, then there's not a downside to family breakdown that needs to be addressed, say, through adoption. From this perspective, that's what really outrages me about the child protection debate. Ideology trumps reality, and we leave a festering major social problem that perpetuates entrenched disadvantage, and for the sake of what? So that people can keep thinking bad thoughts about the social conservatism of the 1950s, and think good thoughts about themselves by affirming their progressive cultural status, by endorsing politically correct ideas. 
I think ignoring social reality, substituting ideology for the reality and rendering people into victims of that ideology is, should be called out for what it is. I think it's un-Australian because it, it denies the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in the community the opportunities that most of us in this room have taken for granted. Perhaps this also means that those on the centre-right need to have more cultural confidence in countering the counterculture. They should be bolder in asserting the importance of traditional social values as a necessary precondition for understanding and responding to the social problems that plague the underclass. And thinking about it, why shouldn't we have greater cultural conf confidence when social progressivism has produced a social disaster in the form of dysfunction, maltreatment and gross inequality? <coughs> This is also to say that traditional social values, including, dare I say it, the traditional meaning of marriage as a social institution crucial to the welfare of children, aren't fringe moral issues, but are, or rather should be, mainstream policy issues. So I will leave you with this thought. If we are prepared to cut through the fog of the cultural politics, might it just be possible to prosecute a centre-right social policy agenda, the clear and stated purpose of which is to advance Australia's enviable record of improving the circumstances of our underclass underdogs. Thank you.